All of the ad roll, this bit here and throughout the rest of this video, is being recorded on the S5 and the Blackmagic Video Assist. We're recording in 4K, 25 frames per second, in Blackmagic RAW using the 12 to 1 compression ratio. On screen now you can see the total length of this video as well as the end file size just for your information. What up folks, Alex here, Mr. Alex Tech, and yes, in this video I'm going to be answering your questions regarding using the Panasonic S5 with the Blackmagic Video Assist to record Blackmagic RAW. So let's get straight into it with the first question, what firmware do I need? Well your Panasonic S5 needs to be on at least version 2.3 or above, and then the Blackmagic Video Assist needs to be at, at least version 3.4.3. Both of the firmwares are easy to get, just Google them and you'll find them on either the Blackmagic support website or Panasonic's own firmware website. Next up, what equipment do I actually need? Well, it really depends on the type of setup that you're going for. If you're going for a static studio style setup, sort of what I'm using here, I've got my video assist on a separate tripod just next to my camera, then you don't actually need much at all. The video assist comes with a power adapter so you can plug it into the wall, again, which is what I'm doing now. And then you just need a micro HDMI to full size HDMI just to plug it into your camera to get the raw feed coming through. Oh, and you'll also need some sort of media to record to, either an SD card or a solid state drive or an SSD. I personally have been using an SSD, but I'll cover recording media a little bit later on in the video as well. Now, if you want a run and gun style setup, then there are a few additional things you're gonna need. For starters, you're gonna need batteries. They are the Sony NP style battery. They're really easy to get hold of, loads on Amazon. I'll talk about batteries in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then you're gonna need some method of actually attaching your video assist to your S5. Straight out of the box, there isn't really a method to mount them together. Now, the easiest thing to do is to buy a cage for your S5, which is exactly what I did. I went for a small rig cage. Now, I'm not sponsored by small rig or anything like that. I just, that's what I'd seen when I was browsing. They're relatively available. They're reasonably affordable. Everything from Amazon. All the stuff that I bought is linked down in the description below. You put the cage on your S5 and then you need some sort of mount. I went for a little swivel mount, which bolts to that cage and then attaches to the video assist using one of the six threaded tripod mounts on the video assist itself. Then I also picked up a few additional bits. You don't necessarily need these, but they just made my life a little bit easier. I plan to record using an SSD rather than an SD card. So I picked up the SSD holder. Again, that just attaches directly to the video assist. And then because I was a little bit worried about that micro HDMI port, I also then picked up the HDMI sort of adapter, again from Small Rig, which just bolts to the side of your cage and then gives you a full HDMI port instead. It just means that everything's that little bit more secure. Now, how much does that whole setup weigh? Well, my setup, so that's the S5 with the kit lens, with the cage, with the video assist, the batteries, the SD card, everything, it weighs a little over three kilograms, which is about six and a half pounds. So it's certainly not light, it's quite a heavy little beastie to be carrying around with you all day. So how easy is it to use? Well, it's actually surprisingly easy. Once you've built it all up and you've got your rig ready to go, all you need to do, hop into the menu of the S5 and make sure that you've enabled the HDMI RAW output. Then you hop onto the video assist and make sure you've selected Blackmagic RAW as well as a few other bits, and then you're pretty much good to go. The UI on the video assist is really, really nice. It's really, really easy to navigate. Everything's pretty much where you expect it to be, so it's really easy to use. The video assist also has some additional nice features, like you can get histograms on there, scopes, focus peaking, you can install your own LUTs on there. There's loads of really good stuff, and again, it's all really easy to find, easy to use, so there's no problems there at all, honestly. Then moving on to frame rate and resolution options. Now, I don't have any anamorphic lenses, so I've not really delved into the anamorphic side of things, so we're just going to stick to the standard aspect ratios for this one. First of all, let's talk about PAL. There are three options when recording in PAL. You've got a 5.9K or 6K full frame readout, so there's no crop with that, and that's in 25 frames per second. Your other two options are using a super 35 millimeter crop, which is the same as APS-C, so it's a 1.5 times crop. They're in a 17.9 aspect ratio, which is actually what you're watching now, so it's slightly wider, not quite as tall as your usual. The frame rates available in that option are 50 frames per second and 25 frames per second. For NTSC, very similar. The 6K full frame readout is either 30 frames per second or 24 frames per second. Again, that's with no crop. And then the Cinema 4K Super 35mm crop, your options are either 60 frames per second, 
30 frames per second or 24 frames per second. Now quick note, when you are exporting the Blackmagic RAW from the camera, you can't record internally. Those frame rates are only available to record directly within the Blackmagic Video Assist itself. You can't be recording both, so you can't be recording to the internal SD card as well as the Blackmagic Video Assist. It's one or the other. Now another real quick thing to mention when you're exporting the Blackmagic RAW, once again, the only picture profile that you can use is VLOG. You're locked into using VLOG. Now what that also means is the lowest ISO you can use is 640 because that's the base ISO when using VLOG. So it's just important to let you know those two things. Now as mentioned, when you are exporting that Blackmagic RAW, you are stuck in VLOG, which is why it is really handy that you can import your own LUTs to this thing. So rather than viewing a really faded out, low contrast, low color image, you can apply a LUT. Panasonic did release a VLOG to Rec. 709, so you can just install that on here, choose that, and then everything you see will give you a better idea of what you're actually seeing once you get it into DaVinci Resolve. When you select the Blackmagic RAW, you've got two options in terms of quality. You've got a constant bitrate or a constant quality. Constant quality gives you a Q0, Q1, Q3, or Q5. So a quality zero is basically the very best quality. Quality five is the lowest quality, and then you've got everything in between. Now they use a variable bitrate. So the bitrate will change up and down to keep that quality. So quality zero will give you the very best quality out of the Blackmagic RAW. The bitrate may be all over the place, which means you never quite know what your file size is going to be. Or you can use the constant bitrate, which is more like what you'd expect from a standard sort of mirrorless or digital SLR camera, where you set a bitrate and then the quality will essentially be adjusted to match that bitrate. Now I've just stuck with the constant bitrate. Your options are actually done in compression. So you've got the very best, which is a three to one compression ratio, five to one, eight to one, and then the worst is 12 to one. So three to one will give you the best quality and the biggest file sizes. 12 to 1 will give you the lowest quality, but the smallest file sizes. Now 12 to 1 is still perfectly fine. I'm recording this at 12 to 1. So if you think this looks pretty good, then 12 to 1 is absolutely fine. If you're uploading to YouTube, YouTube uses loads of compression anyway. I don't think you need to be using the highest level. Just stick to 12 to 1. You've got loads more space to record with and you're good to go. If you're doing stuff for other media, then maybe it starts to make a little bit more sense. Is it better to use an SD card or an SSD? Well, for me personally, the SSDs make far more sense. Both the five and the seven inch video assists have a type C port on them. So you can just buy an SSD, plug it in, record the SSD, and then you're good to go. The reason I like the SSDs, first of all, they're cheaper for the amount of memory that you can get. My 500 gigabyte Samsung T5 cost me a little under 70 pounds, which is really quite cheap for 500 gig. And then the second thing is once you finish recording, you just plug your SSD into your PC and then you can edit directly off there. You don't even need to worry about transferring the files. Now, if you do want to use an SD card, I just need to let you know, you ideally do need to be using a UHS-2 card, the faster card, because the UHS-1 card can't keep up with all of the different video formats. Now, I actually tested one of my SanDisk Extreme UHS-1 cards, and I was using the 6K 12 to 1 compression. I could record in with no issues. 8 to 1, I could record again with no issues, but the 5 to 1 or 3 to 1, the video assist started throwing up errors saying that basically the card couldn't keep up with the video. So you just need to bear that in mind. If you want to get the most from the video assist, you're better off going with an SSD. But SSDs generally make more sense to me personally because for 500 gig, they're cheaper. If I wanted 500 gigs worth of SD cards, even the slowest cards would still be more expensive than that £70 SSD which I bought. So yeah, it just makes more sense personally. Is there any notable lag or color cast? Lag, there is a little bit. I did this quick demonstration so you can see it for yourself. As you can see, the video assist is slightly behind the actual screen on the back of the S5. Now I've actually counted the frames. I was recording this at 25 frames per second. It's about four frames difference, which equates to about 160 milliseconds. So you're looking at about 150, 160 milliseconds of lag on the video assist compared to the screen on the back of the S5. That's rough, it may vary around there, but that gives you a rough ballpark figure. Is it unusable? No, I didn't really mind it at all. You do adjust to it fairly quickly. The only time I did notice it, when I was manually focusing, I was pulling focus. Sometimes you may go past the point where you mean to, and then have to come back a little bit because of that slight lag, but you do adapt to it relatively quickly. In terms of color cast, I don't notice any. Again, I'm looking at the screen on the S5 and the video assist. They look fairly similar. 
pretty much identical, honestly. It is really hard to tell, but I don't see any real noticeable color cast on there. Now, nobody asked this, but I figured it's worth talking about starting and stopping recording. By default, out the box, you actually have to use the record button on the touchscreen on the video assist to start the recording. Because the video feed is coming out of the S5, the record button on the top of the camera doesn't actually start or stop the recording, only using the touchscreen. But you can enable it, there's a few things you need to do, and basically what happens is when you trigger the time code on the camera, that automatically triggers the time code on the video assist, which starts the recording. So then you can use the record button as you usually would. For reference, if you want to do this yourself, first on the video assist, go to the record menu, trigger record, video start, stop. On the S5, go to the video menu, image format, time code, and enable the HDMI output. Then go to the custom menu, in and out, and then the HDMI record output. Once that's enabled, simply hitting the record button on the camera will trigger the record on the video assist. It does really make a world of difference because you don't have to take a hand off the camera to hit record, you just hit record as you usually would. Trust me, if you pick it up, it's worth doing. Is there any overheating? No, I haven't experienced any personally. I've recorded for a fair chunk of time in here and there's no issues whatsoever. And I also was out recording for about two hours in really hot weather, the UK, it was about 30 degrees, middle of the day, the sun was beating down and it didn't overheat once. It felt hot to touch, it felt very hot to touch. I don't know whether that was the internal heat or just the heat of the sun on the chassis was making it really warm. It felt really hot, but at no point did it stop recording or even throw up any errors. There is a fan built into the Blackmagic Video Assist that obviously does help to keep it cool. Can you hear it? Yes. Is it noticeably sort of audible? No, you don't really need to worry about it, but it certainly does do a good job of keeping it cool. Are there any recording limits? Not as far as I'm aware. There's no information about there being recording limits. Usually they would make a point of it if it did have a 30 minute recording limit, for example. I've tested it. I've done a bunch of recordings that have gone over 30 minutes and at no point did it stop to say that it couldn't record any longer. How bright is the screen? The screen is really, really bright. It's rated at about 2,500 nits. So purely for reference to make that number make a bit of sense, most smartphones are in the range of about 700 to 900 nits. Some go to 1,000, but that's pretty rare these days. So the Blackmagic Video Assist is roughly three, four times brighter than your average smartphone. Again, I was using it in bright sunlight without a screen shade and it was absolutely fine. I could see what I was doing. I was manually focusing and I could still manually focus bright sunlight without a screen shade. So yeah, nice and bright, perfectly usable. Is it better or worse than the Pocket Cinema 4K or 6K? The honest answer to that is I don't know. I don't have either of those. I've never played with either of those, so I can't really do a like for like comparison. There are like for like comparisons online, so you can have a look on YouTube. I've linked one down in the description below, so you can go check that out. What I will say though, the really obvious thing is they're very different cameras. The S5 is a hybrid stills camera at the end of the day. It's a stills mirrorless camera that has really good video options that can then also be built into this cinema style rig, which means it's great for getting the best 6K raw footage if you want that. But if I wanna go out walking, I wanna take some photos, I can strip it all down to its bare minimum. I can use it to take some still images and I can use it to record a vlog or whatever as well. Internally, you've got 4K 10-bit footage, which looks really, really good. So yeah, it's a bit of everything. You can do a lot with it. The Blackmagic Cinema ranges are, of course, pocket cinema cameras. So that has its own benefits. They're designed to do just that, but you wouldn't want to try and take stills or vlog with one of those. So it really depends on what you want from your device. So what's it like to edit? What's the editing process? Now, the files are just one big file. It doesn't split the files, I did a really long 30 odd minute recording and it was 130 something gig, just a single Blackmagic RAW file. You import that into DaVinci Resolve in exactly the same manner and then you just color grade it in pretty much the same way. You do have access to the RAW controls within the color page, which I'll show you in a moment, but then you just grade it in exactly the same way that you usually would. If you've ever graded any vlog footage, then you pretty much be doing the same thing. The main difference is you've got a little bit more scope you can recover those shadows a bit more, you can get the highlights back, you can mess with the colors, you do a heavier grade without destroying the footage because you've got all that data to play with. So now to give you an actual idea of what it's like and how it works in DaVinci Resolve, let's boot this file up. So I'm gonna stop this recording, time travel, very confusing. We're gonna try it on the MacBook so you can see how it edits on the M1 Air and I'll give you a quick guide of how it all works. 
So here we are in DaVinci Resolve 17 Studio on my MacBook Air and I've got this timeline set up. I'm just going to show you really quickly the timeline settings. As you can see, we're using a custom resolution. We're actually matching the resolution, the 4K 17 by 9 that's come straight out of the camera. And we're just going to open up the file. This is the B-Roll file. This is running straight off the SSD. So I haven't actually imported this. It's running off the T5. We can just pop it on here. And just for reference, I'm going to go playback. I'm not using any proxies. And as you can see, straight off the bat, it's pretty snappy. I click around the timeline. I can hit play. I'm getting my full 25 frames per second. So the MacBook is having no issues at all playing this footage back directly off the SSD. So first of all, that's really good. It shows that the B-Raw is really quite efficient. We're running this with no issues at all. I've also tested this on my Windows PC and got exactly the same result. It was nice and easy to edit, no problems whatsoever. Now, as you can see, it looks really flat because it's in Vlog. So the footage you've just watched, the A-Roll, I didn't actually do very much to it at all. All I've done, I'm gonna hop straight into the color tab. I've got this Panasonic Vlog to 709 LUT, so I'm just gonna drag that on there initially, just to bring it back to 709 so we can see at least a little bit of color, a little bit of contrast, something in there. And then we can start to do a bit more of a grade. Then the additional raw panel that you get access to in the color page, right over on the far left here, you've got this one which is called Camera Raw, and then you've got these options in here. By default, it's gonna decode using all of the project settings, but if I just change that to clip, I have access to all of these. So I've got the color science, white balance, color space, and gamma, so I can change all of those. And over on the right here, we've got the color temperature. So I can adjust the color temperature like so. I can change the tint and then I can change the exposure so I can bring it up and I can bring it down. And then from there, you just go and you'd edit it in pretty much the same way. So I'm gonna go with 6000. We'll just revert that back to as it was. We're just gonna hop into the primary wheels. And all I would do for this is I'd stretch it out. I'd probably I might bring the overall sort of exposure up and then bring the shadows down. That's too high, bring that back. Bit of contrast, maybe adjust the saturation and the temp, that sort of thing, but I wouldn't go mad. I didn't go mad for this video. I went somewhere along those lines. And if we just reset that, you can see the difference it's made in not very long at all. Now we'll just jump back onto the edit page. It's too bright, I would have to knock that down. But as you can see, even with the grades applied, we can still hop around we can still skip around on the timeline with no issues whatsoever. And there you go. That's it. I hope this answered all of your questions. If you've got any more, please do leave them in the comment section below, and I'll certainly do my best to get back to you with any answers if I can. Thanks for watching. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Thoughts and feedback down below. Subscribe if you're new here. Take it easy. I'll catch you next time. See ya.